Hello, and welcome to Bite Sized Audio. I'm Simon Stanhope, actor, narrator, and curator of this channel. Today's story is a classic Victorian ghost story The Shadow in the Corner by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. As usual, I've put some biographical notes in the video description, but in summary, Mary Elizabeth Braddon, 1835 to 1915, was an actress before turning to writing fiction. She was particularly associated with the sensation novels, which were hugely popular in the mid-Victorian era, of which Lady Audley's Secret, 1862, is an outstanding example, and the work for which she is best remembered today. It made her name and fortune, and it's never been out of print. In addition, she also wrote a number of supernatural short stories. In my opinion, The Shadow in the Corner is one of her best, and one of the very best of the genre. It was first published in Temple Bar magazine in 1879. THE SHADOW IN THE CORNER Wild Heath Grange stood a little way back from the road, with a barren stretch of heath behind it, and a few tall fir-trees, with straggling wind-tossed heads, were its only shelter. It was a lonely house, on a lonely road, little better than a lane, leading across a desolate waste of sandy fields to the seashore. And it was a house that bore a bad name— among the natives of the village of Holcroft, which was the nearest place where humanity might be found. It was a good old house, nevertheless, substantially built in the days when there was no stint of stone and timber, a good old grey stone house, with many gables, deep window seats, and a wide staircase, long dark passages, hidden doors in queer corners, closets as large as some modern rooms, and cellars, in which a company of soldiers might have lain perdu. This spacious old mansion was given over to rats and mice, loneliness, echoes, and the occupation of three elderly people. Michael Bascombe, whose forebears had been landowners of importance in the neighbourhood, and his two servants, Daniel Skegg and his wife, who had served the owner of that grim old house ever since he left the university, where he had lived fifteen years of his life, five as student and ten as professor of natural science. At three-and-thirty Michael Bascombe had seemed a middle-aged man. At fifty-six he looked and moved and spoke like an old man. During that interval of twenty-three years he had lived alone in Wildheath Grange, and the country people told each other that the house had made him what he was. This was a fanciful and superstitious notion on their part, doubtless, yet it would not have been difficult to have traced a certain affinity between the dull grey building and the man who lived in it. Both seemed alike, remote from the common cares and interests of humanity. Both had an air of settled melancholy, engendered by perpetual solitude. Both had the same faded complexion, the same look of slow decay. Yet, lonely as Michael Bascombe's life was at Wildheath Grange, he would not, on any account, have altered its tenor. He had been glad to exchange the comparative seclusion of college rooms for the unbroken solitude of Wildheath. He was a fanatic in his love of scientific research, and his quiet days were filled to the brim with labours that seldom failed to interest and satisfy him. There were periods of depression, occasional moments of doubt, when the goal towards which he strove seemed unattainable, and his spirit fainted within him. Happily, such times were rare with him. He had a dogged power of continuity, which ought to have carried him to the highest pinnacle of achievement, and which perhaps might ultimately have won for him a grand name and a worldwide renown. But for a catastrophe, 
which burdened the declining years of his harmless life, with an unconquerable remorse. One autumn morning, when he had lived just three and twenty years at Wildheath, and had only lately begun to perceive that his faithful butler and body-servant, who was middle-aged when he first employed him, was actually getting old, Mr. Bascombe's breakfast meditations over the latest treatise on the atomic theory were interrupted by an abrupt demand from that very Daniel Skegg. The man was accustomed to wait upon his master in the most absolute silence, and his sudden breaking out into speech was almost as startling as if the bust of Socrates above the bookcase had burst into human language. "'It's no use,' said Daniel. "'My missus must have a girl.' "'A what?' demanded Mr. Bascombe, without taking his eyes from the line he had been reading. "'A girl, a girl to trot about and wash up, and help the old lady. She's getting weak on her legs, poor soul. We've none of us grown younger in the last twenty years.' Twenty years?' echoed Michael Bascombe, scornfully. "'What is twenty years in the formation of a strata? What, even in the growth of an oak, the cooling of a volcano?' "'Not much, perhaps, but it's apt to tell upon the bones of a human being. The manganese staining to be seen upon some skulls would certainly indicate,' began the scientist, dreamily, I wish my bones were only as free from rheumatics as they were twenty years ago, pursued Daniel testily, and then perhaps I should make light of twenty years. Howsoever, the long and the short of it is, my missus must have a girl. She can't go on trotting up and down these everlasting passages, and standing in that stone scullery year after year, just as if she was a young woman. She must have a girl to help. "'Let her have twenty girls,' said Mr. Bascombe, going back to his book. "'What's the use of talking like that, sir? Twenty girls, indeed. We shall have rare work to get one.' "'Because the neighbourhood is sparsely populated?' interrogated Mr. Bascombe, still reading. "'No, sir, because this house is known to be haunted.' Michael Bascombe laid down his book, and turned a look of grave reproach upon his servant. Skeg, he said, in a severe voice, "'I thought you had lived long enough with me to be superior to any folly of that kind.' "'I don't say that I believe in ghosts,' answered Daniel, with a semi-apologetic air. "'But the country people do.' There's not a mortal among them that will venture across our threshold after nightfall. Merely because Antony Bascombe, who led a wild life in London and lost his money and land, came home here broken-hearted, and is supposed to have destroyed himself in this house, the only remnant of property that was left him out of a fine estate. Supposed to have destroyed himself? cried Skegg. Why, the fact is as well known as the death of Queen Elizabeth, or the Great Fire of London. Why, wasn't he buried at the crossroads between here and Holcroft? An idle tradition for which you could produce no substantial proof, retorted Mr. Bascombe. I don't know about proof, but the country people believe it as firmly as they believe their gospel. If their faith in the gospel was a little stronger— they need not trouble themselves about Antony Bascombe. Well, grumbled Daniel, as he began to clear the table, a girl of some kind we must get, but she'll have to be a foreigner, or a girl that's hard driven for a place. When Daniel Skegg said a foreigner, he did not mean the native of some distant clime, but a girl who had not been born and bred at Holcroft. Daniel had been raised and reared in that insignificant hamlet, and, small and dull as it was, he considered the world beyond it only margin. Michael Bascombe was too deep in the atomic theory to give a second thought to the necessities of an old servant. Mrs. Skegg was an individual with whom he rarely came in contact. 
She lived, for the most part, in a gloomy region at the north end of the house, where she ruled over the solitude of a kitchen that looked like a cathedral, and numerous offices of the scullery, larder, and pantry class, where she carried on a perpetual warfare with spiders and beetles, and wore her old life out in the labour of sweeping and scrubbing. She was a woman of severe aspect, dogmatic piety, and a bitter tongue. She was a good, plain cook, and ministered diligently to her master's wants. He was not an epicure, but liked his life to be smooth and easy, and the equilibrium of his mental power would have been disturbed by a bad dinner. He heard no more about the proposed addition to his household for a space of ten days, when Daniel Skegg again startled him amidst his studious repose by the abrupt announcement, "'I've got a girl.' "'Oh?' said Michael Bascom. "'Have you?' and he went on with his book. This time he was reading an essay on phosphorus and its functions in relation to the human brain. "'Yes,' pursued Daniel, in his usual grumbling tone. "'She was a waif and stray, or I shouldn't have got her. If she'd been a native, she'd never have come to us.' "'I hope she's respectable,' said Michael. "'Respectable? That's the only fault she has, poor thing. She's too good for the place. She's never been in service before, but she says she's willing to work, and I dare say my old woman will be able to break her in. Her father was a small tradesman at Yarmouth. He died a month ago, and left this poor thing homeless. Mrs. Midge, at Holcroft, is her aunt, and she said to the girl, "'Come and stay with me till you get a place,' and the girl has been staying with Mrs. Midge for the last three weeks.' trying to hear of a place. When Mrs. Midge heard that my missus wanted a girl to help, she thought it would be the very thing for her niece Maria. Luckily Maria had heard nothing about this house, so the poor innocent dropped me a curtsy and said she'd be thankful to come, and would do her best to learn her duty. She'd had an easy time of it with her father, who had educated her above her station, like a fool as he was growled Daniel. "'By your own account, I'm afraid you've made a bad bargain,' said Michael. "'You don't want a young lady to clean kettles and pans?' "'If she was a young duchess, my old woman would make her work,' retorted Skegg decisively. "'And pray, where are you going to put this girl?' asked Mr. Bascom, rather irritably. "'I can't have a strange young woman tramping up and down the passages outside my room. You know what a wretched sleeper I am, Skegg. A mouse behind the wainscot is enough to wake me.' "'I've thought of that,' answered the butler, with his look of ineffable wisdom. "'I'm not going to put her on your floor. She's to sleep in the attics.' "'Which room?' "'The big one at the north end of the house.' That's the only ceiling that doesn't let water. She might as well sleep in a shower bath as in any of the other attics. The room at the north end, repeated Mr. Bascom thoughtfully. Isn't that? Of course it is, snapped Skegg. But she doesn't know anything about it. Mr. Bascom went back to his books and forgot all about the orphan from Yarmouth until one morning, on entering his study, he was startled by the appearance of a strange girl, in a neat black-and-white cotton gown, busy dusting the volumes which were stacked in blocks upon his spacious writing-table, and doing it with such deft and careful hands that he had no inclination to be angry at this unwonted liberty. Old Mrs. Skegg had religiously refrained from all such dusting, on the plea that she did not wish to interfere with the master's ways. One of the master's ways, therefore, had been to inhale a good deal of dust in the course of his studies. The girl was a slim little thing, with a pale and somewhat old-fashioned face, flaxen hair, braided under a neat muslin cap, a very fair complexion, and light blue eyes. They were the lightest blue eyes Michael Bascom had ever seen, but there was a sweetness and gentleness in their expression 
which atoned for their insipid colour. "'I hope you do not object to my dusting your books, sir,' she said, dropping a curtsy. She spoke with a quaint precision, which struck Michael Bascom as a pretty thing in its way. "'No, I don't object to cleanliness, so long as my books and papers are not disturbed. If you take a volume off my desk, replace it on the spot you took it from. That's all I ask. I will be very careful, sir. Uh, when did you come here? Only this morning, sir. The student seated himself at his desk, and the girl withdrew, drifting out of the room as noiselessly as a flower blown across the threshold. Michael Bascom looked after her curiously. He had seen very little of youthful womanhood in his dry-as-dust career, and he wondered at this girl as at a creature of a species hitherto unknown to him. How fairly and delicately she was fashioned! What a translucent skin! What soft and pleasing accents issued from those rose-tinted lips! A pretty thing, assuredly, this kitchen wench! A pity that in all this busy world there could be no better work found for her than the scouring of pots and pans. Absorbed in considerations about dry bones, Mr. Bascom thought no more of the pale-faced handmaiden. He saw her no more about his rooms. Whatever work she did there was done early in the morning, before the scholar's breakfast. She had been a week in the house when he met her one day in the hall. He was struck by the change in her appearance. The girlish lips had lost their rosebud hue. The pale blue eyes had a frightened look, and there were dark rings round them, as in one whose nights had been sleepless, or troubled by evil dreams. Michael Bascom was so startled by an undefinable look in the girl's face that, reserved as he was by habit and nature, he expanded so far as to ask her what ailed her. "'There is something amiss, I am sure,' he said. "'What is it?' "'Nothing, sir,' she faltered, looking still more scared at his question. "'Indeed, it is nothing, or nothing worth troubling you about.' "'Nonsense! Do you suppose, because I live among books, I have no sympathy with my fellow-creatures? Tell me what is wrong with you, child. You have been grieving about the father you have lately lost, I suppose.' "'No, sir, it is not that.' I shall never leave off being sorry for that. It is a grief which will last me all my life. What? Uh, there is something else, then? asked Michael, impatiently. I see. You are not happy here. Hard work does not suit you. I thought as much. Oh, sir, please don't think that, cried the girl, very earnestly. Indeed, I am glad to work, glad to be in service. It is only— she faltered and broke down, the tears rolling slowly from her sorrowful eyes, despite her effort to keep them back. "'Only what?' cried Michael, growing angry. "'The girl is full of secrets and mysteries. What do you mean, wench?' "'I—I I know it is very foolish, sir, but I am afraid of the room where I sleep.' "'Afraid? Why?' "'Shall I tell you the truth, sir? Will you promise not to be angry?' "'I will not be angry, if you will only speak plainly. But you provoke me by these hesitations and suppressions. And please, sir, do not tell Mrs. Skegg that I have told you. She would scold me, or perhaps even send me away.' "'Mrs. Skegg shall not scold you. Go on, child.' "'You may not know the room where I sleep, sir.' It is a large room at one end of the house, looking towards the sea. I can see the dark line of water from the window, and I wonder sometimes to think that it is the same ocean I used to see when I was a child at Yarmouth. It is very lonely, sir, at the top of the house. Mr. and Mrs. Skegg sleep in a little room near the kitchen, you know, sir, and I am quite alone on the top floor." "'Skegg told me you had been educated in advance of your position in life, Maria. 
I should have thought the first effect of a good education would have been to make you superior to any foolish fancies about empty rooms. Oh, pray, sir, do not think it is any fault in my education. Father took such pains with me. He spared no expense in giving me as good an education as a tradesman's daughter need wish for. And he was a religious man, sir. He did not believe— Here she paused, with a suppressed shudder. In the spirits of the dead, appearing to the living, since the days of miracles, when the ghost of Samuel appeared to Saul, he never put any foolish ideas into my head, sir. I hadn't a thought of fear when I first lay down to rest in the big lonely room upstairs. Well, what then? But on the very first night, the girl went on, breathlessly, I felt weighed down in my sleep, as if there were some heavy burden laid upon my chest. It was not a bad dream, but it was a sense of trouble that followed me all through my sleep. And just at daybreak, it begins to be light a little after six, I woke suddenly, with the cold perspiration pouring down my face, and knew that there was something dreadful in the room. What do you mean by something dreadful? Did you see anything? Not much, sir, but it froze the blood in my veins, and I knew it was this that had been following me and weighing upon me all through my sleep. In the corner, between the fireplace and the wardrobe, I saw a shadow, a dim, shapeless shadow, uh, produced by an angle of the wardrobe, I dare say. No, sir, I could see the shadow of the wardrobe, distinct and sharp, as if it had been painted on the wall. This shadow was in the corner, a strange, shapeless mass. Or, if it had any shape at all, it seemed— What? asked Michael, eagerly. The shape of a dead body, hanging against the wall— Michael Bascom grew strangely pale, yet he affected utter incredulity. "'Poor child,' he said kindly. "'You have been fretting about your father until your nerves are in a weak state, and you are full of fancies. <laughs> a shadow in the corner, indeed. Why, at daybreak, every corner is full of shadows. My old coat, flung upon a chair, will make you as good a ghost as you need care to see.' Oh, sir, I have tried to think it is my fancy, but I have had the same burden weighing me down every night. I have seen the same shadow every morning. But when broad daylight comes, can you not see what stuff your shadow is made of? No, sir. The shadow goes before it is broad daylight. Of course, just like other shadows. Come, come, Get these silly notions out of your head, or you will never do for the workaday world. I could easily speak to Mrs. Skegg and make her give you another room, if I wanted to encourage you in your folly, but that would be about the worst thing I could do for you. Besides, she tells me that all the other rooms on that floor are damp, and, no doubt, if she shifted you into one of them, you would discover another shadow in another corner, and get rheumatism into the bargain.' No, my good girl, you must try to prove yourself the better for a superior education. I will do my best, sir, Maria answered meekly, dropping a curtsy. Maria went back to the kitchen, sorely depressed. It was a dreary life she led at Wildheath Grange, dreary by day, awful by night, for the vague burden and the shapeless shadow which seemed so slight a matter to the elderly scholar, were unspeakably terrible to her. Nobody had told her that the house was haunted, yet she walked about those echoing passages, wrapped round with a cloud of fear. She had no pity from Daniel Skegg and his wife. Those two pious souls had made up their minds that the character of the house should be upheld, so far as Maria went. To her, as a foreigner, the Grange should be maintained to be an immaculate dwelling, 
tainted by no sulphurous blast from the underworld. A willing, biddable girl had become a necessary element in the existence of Mrs. Skegg. That girl had been found, and that girl must be kept. Any fancies of a supernatural character must be put down with a high hand. "'Ghosts, indeed!' cried the amiable Skegg. "'Read your Bible, Maria, and don't talk no more about ghosts.' "'There are ghosts in the Bible,' said Maria, with a shiver at the recollection of certain awful passages in the Scripture she knew so well. "'Ah, they was in their right place, or they wouldn't have been there,' retorted Mrs. Skegg. "'You ain't a-going to pick holes in your Bible, I hope, Maria, at your time of life.' Maria sat down quietly in her corner by the kitchen fire, and turned over the leaves of her dead father's Bible, till she came to the chapters they two had loved best, and oftenest read together. He had been a simple-minded, straightforward man, the Yarmouth cabinet-maker, a man full of aspirations after good, innately refined, instinctively religious. He and his motherless girl had spent their lives alone together, in the neat little home which Maria had so soon learnt to cherish and beautify. And they had loved each other with an almost romantic love. They had had the same tastes, the same ideas. Very little had sufficed to make them happy. But inexorable death parted father and daughter, in one of those sharp, sudden partings, which are like the shock of an earthquake instantaneous ruin, desolation, and despair. Maria's fragile form had bent before the tempest. She had lived through a trouble that might have crushed a stronger nature. Her deep religious convictions, and her belief that this cruel parting would not be forever, had sustained her. She faced life and its cares and duties with a gentle patience which was the noblest form of courage. Michael Bascombe told himself that the servant-girl's foolish fancy about the room that had been given her was not a matter of serious consideration. Yet the idea dwelt in his mind unpleasantly, and disturbed him at his labours. The exact sciences require the complete power of a man's brain, his utmost attention, and on this particular evening Michael found that he was only giving his work a part of his attention. The girl's pale face, the girl's tremulous tones, thrust themselves into the foreground of his thoughts. He closed his book with a fretful sigh, wheeled his large armchair round the fire, and gave himself up to contemplation. To attempt study with so disturbed a mind was useless, it was a dull, grey evening, early in November. The student's reading lamp was lighted, but the shutters were not yet shut, nor the curtains drawn. He could see the leaden sky outside his windows, the fir tree tops tossing in the angry wind. He could hear the wintry blast whistling amidst the gables, before it rushed off seaward with a savage howl that sounded like a war whoop. Michael Bascombe shivered and drew nearer the fire. <laughs> it's childish, foolish nonsense, he said to himself. Yet it's strange she should have that fancy about the shadow, for they say Anthony Bascombe destroyed himself in that room. I remember hearing it when I was a boy, from an old servant whose mother was housekeeper at the great house in Anthony's time. I never heard how he died, poor fellow, whether he poisoned himself, or shot himself, or cut his throat, but I've been told that was the room. Old Skegg has heard it too. I could see that by his manner when he told me the girl was to sleep there. He sat for a long time, till the grey of evening outside his study windows changed to the black of night and the war-whoop of the wind died away to a low, complaining murmur. He sat, looking into the fire, and letting his thoughts wander back to the past, 
and the traditions he had heard in his boyhood. That was a sad, foolish story of his great-uncle, Antony Bascom. The pitiful story of a wasted fortune and a wasted life. A riotous collegiate career at Cambridge, a racing stable at Newmarket, an imprudent marriage, a dissipated life in London, a runaway wife, an estate forfeited to moneylenders, and then the fatal end. Michael had often heard that dismal story, how, when Antony Bascom's fair, false wife had left him, when his credit was exhausted and his friends had grown tired of him, and all was gone except Wild Heath Grange, Antony, the broken-down man of fashion, had come to that lonely house unexpectedly one night, and had ordered his bed to be got ready for him in the room where he used to sleep when he came to the place for the wild duck shooting in his boyhood. His old blunderbuss was still hanging over the mantelpiece, where he had left it when he came into the property, and could afford to buy the newest thing in fowling pieces. He had not been to Wild Heath for fifteen years. Nay, for a good many of those years he had almost forgotten that the drear old house belonged to him. The woman who had been housekeeper at Bascom Park, till house and lands had passed into the hands of the creditors, was at this time the sole occupant of Wild Heath. She cooked some supper for her master, and made him as comfortable as she could, in the long untenanted dining-room. But she was distressed to find, when she cleared the table, after he had gone upstairs to bed, that he had eaten hardly anything. Next morning she got his breakfast ready in the same room, which she managed to make brighter and cheerier than it had looked overnight. Brooms, dusting-brushes, and a good fire did much to improve the aspect of things. But the morning wore on to noon, and the old housekeeper listened in vain for her master's footfall on the stairs. Noon waned to late afternoon. She had made no attempt to disturb him, thinking that he had worn himself out by a tedious journey on horseback, and that he was sleeping the sleep of exhaustion. But when the brief November day, clouded with the first shadows of twilight, the old woman grew seriously alarmed, and went upstairs to her master's door, where she waited in vain for any reply to her repeated calls and knockings. The door was locked on the inside, and the housekeeper was not strong enough to break it open. She rushed downstairs again, full of fear, and ran bareheaded out into the lonely road. There was no habitation nearer than the turnpike on the old coach road, from which this side road branched off to the sea. There was scanty hope of a chance passer-by. The old woman ran along the road, hardly knowing whither she was going, or what she was going to do, but with a vague idea that she must get somebody to help her. Chance favoured her. A cart, laden with seaweed, came lumbering slowly along from the level line of sands, yonder where the land melted into water. A heavy, lumbering farm labourer walked beside the cart. "'For God's sake, come in and burst open my master's door!' she entreated, seizing the man by the arm. "'He's lying dead, or in a fit, and I can't get to help him.' "'All right, missus,' answered the man, as if such an invitation were a matter of daily occurrence. "'Whoa, Dobbin, stand still, oss, and be dung to thee.' Dobbin was glad enough to be brought to anchor on the patch of waste grass in front of the Grange garden. His master followed the housekeeper upstairs, and shattered the old-fashioned box-lock with one blow of his ponderous fist. The old woman's worst fear was realised. Antony Bascom was dead. But the mode and manner of his death Michael had never been able to learn. The housekeeper's daughter, who told him the story, was an old woman when he was a boy. She had only shaken her head, and looked unutterable things when he questioned her too closely. She had never even admitted that the old squire had committed suicide. Yet the tradition of his self-destruction 
was rooted in the minds of the natives of Holcroft, and there was a settled belief that his ghost, at certain times and seasons, haunted Wild Heath Grange. Now, Michael Bascombe was a stern materialist. For him, the universe, with all its inhabitants, was a great machine, governed by inexorable laws. To such a man, the idea of a ghost was simply absurd, as absurd as the assertion that two and two make five, or that a circle can be formed of a straight line. Yet he had a kind of dilettante interest in the idea of a mind which could believe in ghosts. The subject offered an amusing psychological study. This poor little pale girl, now, had evidently got some supernatural terror into her head, which could only be conquered by rational treatment. "'I know what I ought to do,' Michael Bascombe said to himself suddenly. "'I'll occupy that room myself to-night, and demonstrate to this foolish girl that her notion about the shadow is nothing more than a silly fancy, bred of timidity and low spirits. An ounce of proof is better than a pound of argument. If I can prove to her that I have spent a night in the room and seen no such shadow, she will understand what an idle thing superstition is. Daniel came in presently to shut the shutters. "'Tell your wife to make up my bed in the room where Maria has been sleeping, and to put her into one of the rooms on the first floor for to-night, Skeg,' said Mr. Bascombe. "'Sir?' Mr. Bascombe repeated his order. "'That silly wench has been complaining to you about her room,' Skeg exclaimed indignantly. "'She doesn't deserve to be well fed and cared for in a comfortable home. She ought to go to the workhouse.' "'Don't be angry with the poor girl, Skeg. She has taken a foolish fancy into her head, and I want to show her how silly she is,' said Mr. Bascombe. "'And you want to sleep in his—in that room yourself?' said the butler. "'Precisely.' "'Well,' mused Skeg, "'if he does walk, which I don't believe, he was your own flesh and blood, and I don't suppose he'll do you any hurt.' When Daniel Skegg went back to the kitchen, he railed mercilessly at poor Maria, who sat pale and silent in her corner by the hearth, darning old Mrs. Skegg's grey worsted stockings, which were the roughest and harshest armour that ever human foot clothed itself withal. "'Was there ever such a whimsical fine lady like Miss?' demanded Daniel "'to come into a gentleman's house and drive him out of his own bedroom to sleep in an attic?' with her nonsenses and vagaries. If this was the result of being educated above one station, Daniel declared that he was thankful he had never got so far in his schooling as to read words of two syllables without spelling. Education might be hanged for him, if this was all it led to. "'I am very sorry,' faltered Maria, weeping silently over her work. "'Indeed, "'Mr. Skegg, I made no complaint. "'My master questioned me, and I told him the truth. "'That was all.' "'All!' exclaimed Mr. Skegg, irately. "'All, indeed. "'I should think it was enough.' "'Poor Maria held her peace. "'Her mind, fluttered by Daniel's unkindness, "'had wandered away from that bleak, big kitchen "'to the lost home of the past.' the snug little parlour where she and her father had sat beside the cosy hearth on such a night as this, she with her smart work-box and her plain sewing, he with the newspaper he loved to read, the petted cat purring on the rug, the kettle singing on the bright brass trivet, the tea-tray pleasantly suggestive of the most comfortable meal in the day. Oh, those happy nights! That dear companionship! Were they really gone for ever, leaving nothing behind them but unkindness and servitude? Michael Bascombe retired later than usual that night. He was in the habit of sitting at his books long after every other lamp but his own had been extinguished. The skeggs had subsided into silence and darkness 
in their drear, ground-floor bedchamber. Tonight his studies were of a peculiarly interesting kind, and belonged to the order of recreative reading, rather than of hard work. He was deep in the history of that mysterious people who had their dwelling-place in the Swiss lakes, and was much exercised by certain speculations and theories about them. The old eight-day clock on the stairs was striking two, as Michael slowly ascended, candle in hand, to the hitherto unknown region of the attics. At the top of the staircase he found himself facing a dark, narrow passage which led northwards, a passage that was in itself sufficient to strike terror to a superstitious mind. So black and uncanny did it look. "'Poor child!' mused Mr. Bascom, thinking of Maria. "'This attic floor is rather dreary, and for a young mind prone to fancies.' He had opened the door of the north room by this time, and stood looking about him. It was a large room, with a ceiling that sloped on one side, but was fairly lofty upon the other, an old-fashioned room, full of old-fashioned furniture, big, ponderous, clumsy, associated with a day that was gone and people that were dead. A walnut-wood wardrobe stared him in the face, a wardrobe with brass handles, which gleamed out of the darkness like diabolical eyes. There was a tall four-post bedstead, which had been cut down on one side to accommodate the slope of the ceiling, and which had a misshapen and deformed aspect in consequence. There was an old mahogany bureau that smelt of secrets. There were some heavy old chairs with rush bottoms, mouldy with age and much worn. There was a corner washstand with a big basin and a small jug, the odds and ends of past years. Carpet there was none, save a narrow strip beside the bed. <laughs> "'It is a dismal room,' mused Michael, with the same touch of pity for Maria's weakness which he had felt on the landing just now. To him it mattered nothing where he slept, but having let himself down to a lower level by his interest in the Swiss lake people, he was in a manner humanized by the lightness of his evening's reading, and was even inclined to compassionate the weaknesses of a foolish girl. He went to bed, determined to sleep his soundest. The bed was comfortable, well supplied with blankets, rather luxurious than otherwise, and the scholar had that agreeable sense of fatigue which promises profound and restful slumber. He dropped off to sleep quickly, but woke with a start ten minutes afterwards. What was this consciousness of a burden of care that had awakened him, this sense of all-pervading trouble that weighed upon his spirits and oppressed his heart, this icy horror of some terrible crisis in life through which he must inevitably pass. To him these feelings were as novel as they were painful. His life had flowed on with smooth and sluggish tide, unbroken by so much as a ripple of sorrow. Yet Tonight, he felt all the pangs of unavailing remorse, the agonizing memory of a life wasted, the stings of humiliation and disgrace, shame, ruin, a hideous death which he had doomed himself to die by his own hand. These were the horrors that pressed him round and weighed him down as he lay in Antony Bascom's room. Yes, even he, the man who could recognize nothing in nature, or in nature's God, better or higher than an irresponsible and invariable machine governed by mechanical laws, was fain to admit that here he found himself face to face with a psychological mystery. This trouble, which came between him and sleep, was the trouble that had pursued Antony Bascom on the last night of his life. So had the suicide felt as he lay in that lonely room, perhaps striving to rest his wearied brain 
with one last earthly sleep, before he passed to the unknown, intermediate land, where all is darkness and slumber. And that troubled mind had haunted the room ever since. It was not the ghost of the man's body that returned to the spot where he had suffered and perished, but the ghost of his mind, his very self. No meaningless simulacrum of the clothes he wore, and the figure that filled them. Michael Bascombe was not the man to abandon his high ground of sceptical philosophy without a struggle. He tried his hardest to conquer this oppression that weighed upon mind and sense. Again and again he succeeded in composing himself to sleep, but only to wake again and again to the same torturing thoughts, the same remorse, the same despair. So the night passed in unutterable weariness. For though he told himself that the trouble was not his trouble, that there was no reality in the burden, no reason for the remorse, these vivid fancies were as painful as realities, and took a stronger hold upon him. The first streak of light crept in at the window, dim and cold and grey. Then came twilight, and he looked at the corner, between the wardrobe and the door. Yes, there was the shadow, not the shadow of the wardrobe only, that was clear enough, but a vague and shapeless something which darkened the dull brown wall. So faint, so shadowy, that he could form no conjecture as to its nature, or the thing it represented. He determined to watch this shadow till broad daylight, but the weariness of the night had exhausted him, and before the first dimness of dawn had passed away, he had fallen fast asleep, and was tasting the blessed balm of undisturbed slumber. When he woke, the winter sun was shining in at the lattice, and the room had lost its gloomy aspect. It looked old-fashioned and grey, and brown and shabby, but the depth of its gloom had fled with the shadows and the darkness of night. Mr. Bascombe rose, refreshed by a sound sleep, which had lasted nearly three hours. He remembered the wretched feelings which had gone before that renovating slumber, but he recalled his strange sensations only to despise them, and he despised himself for having attached any importance to them. <laughs> Indigestion, very likely, he told himself, or perhaps mere fancy, engendered of that foolish girl's story. The wisest of us is more under the dominion of imagination than he would care to confess. Well, Maria shall not sleep in this room any more. There is no particular reason why she should, and she shall not be made unhappy to please old Skegg and his wife. When he addressed himself in his usual leisurely way, Mr. Bascombe walked up to the corner where he had seen, or imagined, the shadow, and examined the spot carefully. At first sight he could discover nothing of a mysterious character. There was no door in the papered wall, no trace of a door that had been there in the past. There was no trap-door in the worm-eaten boards. There was no dark, ineradicable stain to hint at murder. There was not the faintest suggestion of a secret or a mystery. He looked up at the ceiling. That was sound enough, save for a dirty patch here and there, where the rain had blistered it. Yes, there was something. An insignificant thing, yet with a suggestion of grimness which startled him. About a foot below the ceiling he saw a large iron hook projecting from the wall, just above the spot where he had seen the shadow of a vaguely defined form. 
he mounted on a chair, the better to examine this hook, and to understand, if he could, the purpose for which it had been put there. It was old and rusty. It must have been there for many years. Who could have placed it there, and why? It was not the kind of hook upon which one would hang a picture or one's garments. It was placed in an obscure corner. Had Antony Bascom put it there on the night he died? Or did he find it there, ready for a fatal use? <laughs> if I were a superstitious man, thought Michael, I should be inclined to believe that Antony Bascom hung himself from that rusty old hook. "'Sleep well, sir?' asked Daniel, as he waited upon his master at breakfast. "'Admirably,' answered Michael, determined not to gratify the man's curiosity. He had always resented the idea that Wild Heath Grange was haunted. "'Oh, indeed, sir. You were so late that I fancied—late, uh, yes, uh, I slept so well that I overshot my usual hour for waking—' But, uh, by the way, Skegg, as that poor girl objects to the room, let her sleep somewhere else. It can't make any difference to us, and it may make some difference to her. Hm, muttered Daniel, in his grumpy way. You didn't see anything queer up there, did you? See anything? Uh, of course not. Well, then, why should she see things— it's all a silly fiddle-faddle. Never mind. Let her sleep in another room. There ain't another room on the top floor that's dry. Then let her sleep on the floor below. She creeps about quietly enough, poor little timid thing. She won't disturb me. Daniel grunted, and his master understood the grunt to mean obedient assent. But here Mr. Bascom was unhappily mistaken. The proverbial obstinacy of the pig family is as nothing compared with the obstinacy of a cross-grained old man, whose narrow mind has never been illuminated by education. Daniel was beginning to feel jealous of his master's compassionate interest in the orphan girl. She was a sort of gentle, clinging thing— that might creep into an elderly bachelor's heart unawares, and make herself a comfortable nest there. "'We shall have fine carryings on, and me and my old woman will be nowhere, if I don't put down my heel pretty strong upon this nonsense,' Daniel muttered to himself, as he carried the breakfast tray to the pantry. Maria met him in the passage. "'Well, Mr. Skegg, what did my master say?' she asked breathlessly. Did he see anything strange in the room? No, girl, what should he see? He said you were a fool. N nothing disturbed him. And he slept there peacefully, faltered Maria. Never slept better in his life. Now don't you begin to feel ashamed of yourself? Yes, she answered meekly. I am ashamed of being so full of fancies. I will go back to my room to-night, Mr. Skegg, if you like, and I will never complain of it again. I hope you won't, snapped Skegg. You've given us trouble enough already. Maria sighed, and went about her work in saddest silence. The day wore slowly on, like all other days in that lifeless old house. The scholar sat in his study. Maria moved softly from room to room, sweeping and dusting in the cheerless solitude. The midday sun faded into the grey of afternoon, and evening came down like a blight upon the dull old house. Throughout that day, Maria and her master never met. Anyone who had been so far interested in the girl as to observe her appearance would have seen that she was unusually pale, and that her eyes had a resolute look as of one who was resolved to face a painful ordeal. She ate hardly anything all day. She was curiously silent. Skegg and his wife put down both these symptoms to temper. "'She won't eat, and she won't talk,' 
said Daniel, to the partner of his joys. That means sulkiness, and I never allowed sulkiness to master me when I was a young man, and you tried it on as a young woman, and I'm not going to be conquered by sulkiness in my old age. Bedtime came, and Maria bade the skeggs a civil good night, and went up to her lonely garret without a murmur. The next morning came, and Mrs. Skegg looked in vain for her patient handmaiden when she wanted Maria's services in preparing the breakfast. "'The wench sleeps sound enough this morning,' said the old woman. "'Go and call her, Daniel. My poor legs can't stand them stairs.' "'Your poor legs are getting uncommon useless,' muttered Daniel testily, as he went to do his wife's behest. He knocked at the door and called Maria, once, twice, thrice, many times. But there was no reply. He tried the door and found it locked. He shook the door violently, cold with fear. Then he told himself that the girl had played him a trick. She had stolen away before daybreak and left the door locked to frighten him. But no— this could not be, for he could see the key in the lock when he knelt down and put his eye to the keyhole. The key prevented his seeing into the room. "'She's in there, laughing in her sleeve at me,' he told himself. "'But I'll soon be even with her.' There was a heavy bar on the staircase, which was intended to secure the shutters of the window that lighted the stairs. It was a detached bar, and always stood in a corner near the window, which it was but rarely employed to fasten. Daniel ran down to the landing and seized upon this massive iron bar, and then ran back to the garret door. One blow from the heavy bar shattered the old lock, which was the same lock the carter had broken with his strong fist seventy years before. The door flew open, and Daniel went into the attic which he had chosen for the stranger's bedchamber. Maria was hanging from the hook in the wall. She had contrived to cover her face decently with her handkerchief. She had hanged herself deliberately, about an hour before Daniel found her, in the early grey of morning. The doctor, who was summoned from Holcroft, was able to declare the time at which she had slain herself. But there was no one who could say what sudden access of terror had impelled her to the desperate act, or under what slow torture of nervous apprehension her mind had given way. The coroner's jury returned the customary merciful verdict of temporary insanity. The girl's melancholy fate darkened the rest of Michael Bascombe's life. He fled from Wildheath Grange as from an accursed spot, and from the skeggs as from the murderers of a harmless, innocent girl. He ended his days at Oxford, where he found the Society of Congenial Minds and the books he loved. But the memory of Maria's sad face and sadder death was his abiding sorrow. Out of that deep shadow his soul was never lifted. You've been listening to a bite-sized audiobook read by Simon Stanhope. If you enjoyed it, do take a look at the channel playlists with links to more than a hundred mystery, detective and ghost stories. And please do click like, leave a comment and subscribe for future uploads. If you'd like to help support the channel further, you could buy me a coffee or become a channel member. And you can find links to do those things in the video description below. This recording is copyright Bite Sized Audio 2022. Thank you for listening.